Square waves are seen in very many electronic circuits. Although the term square wave describes a very specific waveform, they can be considered as part of a more generic waveform called a rectangular waveform or even a digital waveform. In this video, we'll be giving you some essential information about square waves and rectangular waves. We'll describe the waveforms, we'll look at the properties of square waves and rectangular waves, and we'll be giving you some really essential hints and tips for when you're using square waves, rectangular waves, and in fact, any form of digital waveform in an electronic circuit. First, let's listen to what a square wave sounds like when it's passed through an audio amplifier and speaker. In many ways, it's far more interesting than the sound of a sine wave, but it's rather more piercing, and I don't think I'd want to listen to it for too long. Here, compare it to the sine wave sound. Having heard what a square wave sounds like, let's find out more about square waves and rectangular waves. Essentially, they're a form of waveform or electronic signal where the amplitude changes sharply from one value to another. In other words, they have two states. Let's look in a little more detail at square waves. In fact, there are many waveforms that often come under the banner of square waves. So let's look at them in turn. Let's define a square wave first. It is a repetitive waveform that alternates between two states and has an equal time in both states, as we see here. Next, there is what we can call a rectangular waveform. This is again repetitive, but it doesn't have equal times in both states. It could even just become a series of pulses. Finally, there are what might be just called digital waveforms. These again alternate between two states, but they're not periodic and don't repeat after a specific time. They may carry data or signals from various digital points, but the main thing is they're not repetitive. Digital waveforms of all types, square waves, rectangular waves, and non-periodic data waveforms are widely used within logic or digital circuits or processing circuitry. These tend to have standard values for the voltages of the two states. One is close to zero, and the other is close to the supply voltage. These states are often referred to as zero and one, as in a binary number, or low and high. There are a few points to note about square waves. We'll look at the waveforms as they're seen on an oscilloscope, with the amplitude, which is most normally the voltage on the vertical axis, and time on the horizontal axis. The first aspect of a square wave is its amplitude. It's possible to measure the peak or peaked peak values of the waveform, but more usually the voltages of interest are the high and low values. Typically, for logic or digital circuitry, a window is given for these. For example, on the old transistor-transistor logic or TTL schemes using a 5-volt supply line, the voltage for the input of a logic element needed to fall between 0 and 0 0.8 volts for the low state and between 2 and 5 volts for the high state. Then the output window was tighter so that the input to the next stage was guaranteed. It was between 0 and 0 0.5 volts for the low state and 2.7 to 5 volts for the high state. A window for the different states is given because it's not possible to guarantee the exact values. But enough of logic levels. Another key aspect of a square wave is the period of the waveform. This is measured from a particular point on one cycle of the waveform to the same point on the next one. The easiest points to use are either the rising or falling edges of the square wave. And of course, it's also possible to measure the period of rectangular waveforms in the same way. And we can measure the period of different portions of the waveform, looking at one rising edge to the next falling edge, or one falling edge to the next rising one, and so forth. And there's the frequency of the waveform. This is the number of cycles that occur in a second. So by counting the number of times the same point on a waveform occurs in a second, the frequency can be determined. The unit of frequency is the hertz, and this corresponds to one cycle per second. As with the sine wave, the metric multipliers of kilo for a thousand hertz, mega for a million hertz, and even giga for a thousand million hertz are all used. The frequency is actually equal to one upon the time period. 
So if the square or rectangular wave has a time period of one millisecond or a thousandth of a second, then the frequency is one upon a thousandth, which is a thousand hertz or a kilohertz. Another important aspect of a square wave, a rectangular wave, or in fact any digital waveform, is the rise and fall time of the edges. In an ideal world, the waveform would switch instantly between the two levels. But in the real world, this doesn't happen, and it takes a finite time for this switching to take place. It's important to be able to know what the rise and fall times of a circuit may be. There's a standard way of measuring these, otherwise there would be a huge number of measurements that would be used and there would be no commonality. The most common way is to measure the time taken for the waveform to rise from 10% of the final value to 90% of the final value. This is obviously for the rise time. Similarly, for the fall time, the measurement is taken from 90% of the final value to 10%. The time is then measured, often in nanoseconds, as most digital waveforms rise and fall very quickly. The most common way of looking at waveforms is on an oscilloscope, where we see a plot of amplitude, normally voltage, on the vertical axis against time on the horizontal axis. But it's also interesting to look at the spectrum of a square wave. Here we look at what signals are present, plotting amplitude on the vertical scale and frequency on the horizontal scale. Just like tuning a radio over a band of frequencies and plotting the level of the output for each frequency. But first though, if we look at the spectrum of a sine wave, we see that it consists of a single frequency. This is not so for the square wave, where a huge number of signals are seen. If we look more closely, we see that the signal consists of the fundamental and then harmonics at frequencies equal to the odd harmonics of the fundamental, which is a sine wave. The fundamental has the same frequency as the basic repetition rate of the square wave and then different harmonics are added. By adding additional harmonics at the right level, we get nearer to the square wave with the addition of each one. It's possible to express this all mathematically. We see that the square wave can be made up from sine waves corresponding to the odd harmonics of the fundamental. The third harmonic is at a third of the level of the fundamental. The fifth harmonic is at a fifth of the level of the fundamental, and so forth. The more harmonics in the series, the closer it becomes to the ideal square wave. Now, let's look at some essential tips when dealing with square waves. First, when measuring them on a scope, make sure that the scope has sufficient bandwidth. A rule of thumb is that the oscilloscope and its probes should have a bandwidth of at least five times the basic repetition rate of any signal being viewed. Next, make sure that the oscilloscope probe compensation has been properly adjusted. In this way, the best trace will be seen on the scope. If the probe isn't compensated properly, then the waveform seen won't be the best representation of the signal. Now, moving on to some circuit considerations. Some logic circuits require the input signal to have a fast rise time if they're to operate correctly. This is particularly true for edge-triggered devices. For example, if the signal is coming in from a set of discrete circuitry, it may not have a fast enough rise time. I've actually had this problem in the past, and the solution was to pass the signal through a logic buffer or even back-to-back -back inverters on the board. Be aware, though, that each time the signal passes through a logic buffer or inverter, there'll be a small delay. This may not matter for most circuits, but it may be critical in some. Make sure that all the ICs on the logic board are well decoupled. If they're not, it's possible that ringing will be seen on the waveforms, and this has been known to be the cause of false triggering of some logic elements. Also, keep tracks as short as possible between the different areas of the circuit, and don't have tracks for different signals running parallel and close to each other, as this may cause pickup between the signals. Again, this might cause some peculiar effects to be seen, or even false triggering, as we mentioned before. So there we have our summary of the square wave. If you need to find out more, head over to the description section of the video, where there's some more information and some useful links. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and like the video. Thank you.